I enlisted in the Navy. Uh, the reason I did was I uh, grew up outside of a army camp in Wisconsin. I used to watch the soldiers slugging around mud up halfway up to their knees, and I decided I didn't want to sleep in a muddy foxhole. The Korean War had started a couple of months earlier, and I decided that rather than get drafted, I enlist, and I chose the Navy. Uh, I also, I had been working as a construction electrician, and I thought I'd be able to get into the Navy Seabees, the Navy Construction Battalion. Didn't all quite work out that way. Uh, I got into the service, and they made an electronic equipment operator out of me, so I never did get into the construction battalion. I served on board destroyers and became an electronic equipment operator. Uh, a ping jockey, a sonar man, chasing submarines. The way we chased submarines in those days is a lot different from what you see in uh, military movies now. It was pretty crude by comparison. We were part of a hunter-killer group and uh, we chased tame submarines. During the Korean War there were no sub threats against our Navy, but we kept in practice. We kept working and uh, kept in uh, top shape. Uh, chased a lot of tame submarines and a few whales. Since getting out of the Navy, I have joined some veterans organizations, one of which is the Tin Can Sailors Association. That's a group of people who spent time on board the uh, small fighting ships, Tin Cans Destroyers. It gives an opportunity to get together with uh, other veterans and talk about our experiences. Yeah, you can tell sea stories, but you better be careful how much you stretch the truth because you're among a bunch of guys who've been there and done that. Well, it seems though they had a selective service board in Douglas County, Wisconsin, and they said I was duly selected. The interesting part is my brother got highly upset because he was an old Navy man. He couldn't understand how I'd allow myself to be drafted. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your uniform. Well, it's the one they issued us back in 1955, and, and uh, it seemed like they changed the uniform quite a bit since then. You know. Army of Wool and a footlocker after 50 years has a tendency to shrink a little, but it still goes okay, I guess. Oh, yeah. It's kind of interesting here, in uh, 1995 they had a uh, memorial service for Major Richard Bong in Poplar, Wisconsin, which is my sister-in-law's brother, and she wanted to know if I could still wear my old uniform for the service, and I says, well, gee, I don't know, I, I'd have to f see if I can find it. Well, we dug it out of the old footlocker, and my wife got upset because I could button all the buttons, so that's the way that went. Uh, what did you do while you were in the service? And start by well, st I did. St starting out, I got, of course, you go to Fort Leonard, wouldn't take basic training, and then I went on to there at Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, our artillery fire direction center training, and then on to Fort Hood, Texas, and shortly after that, they moved to 1st Armored Division, Fort Polk, Louisiana, where I spent the rest of the two years of the enlistment, and uh, it was artillery. So a short time after that, well, 1961, I got a letter from uh, uh, 14th Corps said that I was to report to commanding officer of 695th Transportation Company. So I did that and was a, happened to be a reserve outfit and and I stayed with that outfit for quite a few years and they reorganized and they made us medics. So you know how that goes. So I was medics for quite a few years and then trans, I moved to Colorado then went into an infantry outfit, was a basic training type outfit. Did you retire from the service? Yes. Uh, okay, I retired so after be, so many years. It would be two years regular and 24 reserve. Okay, could you say, I retired with? Yeah, okay. I retired with the uh, uh, Army Reserve, and uh, of course uh, your retirement paper shows the Army. They don't, they don't se separate that part any. So that's kind of interesting in that respect. Okay. What do you do now as a veteran? Right now, well, we're retired, but we're also I'm commander of the American Legion Post in Castle Rock, which kind of keeps me a little busy. And we're also a commander of a group of 
of veterans that we do uh, honors, military honors at Fort Logan National Cemetery, which comes in auspices of the All Veterans Honor Guard. And that keeps us busy. We have two funerals which we have to go to when I leave here, so. And we had two of the first part of this week already, so. And uh, it seems as though that uh, World War II and the Korean veterans combined are losing about 1,800 veterans a day, so. Our, the numbers are dwindling very fast. Okay. Uh, I got into the service uh, because I was looking forward to serving my country in some way or shape or form in spite of the fact that I had lost this finger on the farm. And uh, anyhow, I got into the Navy and uh, December the 29th, 1943. Then we went to uh, boot camp right outside of Chicago, Great Lakes Naval Training Station, and I was in company 2035. Uh, and uh, I, I enjoyed my time there at boot camp, so to speak, because I had a unique situation in that I had done very well in aircraft recognitioning, and they had me work with some ensigns in an office uh, preparing the slides for the day's training for the recruits. And often I was inside of that nice warm office getting the slides prepared and I'd look out and I'd see my friends out there marching in the cold Illinois January winter. Mm -hmm. I wasn't too popular with them at that time. Okay, what did you do? What was your job? Well, I was a quartermaster uh, when I got on board my ship, the Howard W. Gilmore. And uh, we went on board the ship after training in Treasure Island and et cetera. And we went to Mare Island and got on board the ship, made the 24th, 1944. And soon after that, we went on a shakedown cruise uh, in the San Francisco Bay, and then we went down to San Diego. And I happened to get seasick, by the way, under the, the Golden Gate Bridge in what is known as the Potato Patch. And I had an interesting experience there. My commander, who uh, was our navigator, the quartermasters work with navigators, and the, the, the navigator, Commander Lacey, is giving me a, quite a few orders, and I thought, boy, I'll never remember all these, and then I suddenly got seasick. And I went over to the rail, and this is in the Potato Patch in the San Francisco Bay. I went over to the rail, and I threw up. And I came back, and Commander Lacey said, Hittinga, are you sick? I said, well, kind of. He said, well, forget what I told you. But in the meantime, two fellows came running up the stairway, and they came up to me, and they said, did you throw up over the rail? And I said, well, yeah, I couldn't help it, you know. But they didn't dare do anything else because Commander Lacey was still standing there. Then, later on, I uh, uh, enjoyed my time on the ship, by the way. We went to... Uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. After we had come back from San Diego, we went to Mare Island, and then we went to Pearl Harbor. You see, ours was a submarine tender, our ship, the AS-16, the Howard W. Gilmore, and we carried lots of fuel, torpedoes. We had mach machine shops on board that repaired the, tor the, the submarines if they needed it. Well, then we went to uh, Pearl Harbor. Okay. Uh, what, uh, tell that you're a legionnaire, and Give us a little bit of a description of what you do as a legionnaire. Oh, I, I serve as chaplain. Okay, wait. Say, I'm a legionnaire and I serve. I'm a legionnaire and I serve as a chaplain with the legionnaires, and I speak quite often at the uh, funerals for the veterans that are passing away at a high rate per day up at Fort Logan. I got into the Coast Guard sort of by mistake. I was 17 years old and I went downtown Chicago to join the Navy. And right next to the Navy recruiting station was a Coast Guard station with a large picture of Uncle Sam pointing out to the crowd, said, men of 17, we need you. <laughs> so. <laughs> I walked in and, and uh, took the papers home to my parents because they had a sign when I was 17. And that's how I got into the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. What did you do in the Coast Guard? And 
Okay. I, what I did was the first thing I did naturally was uh, a boot camp, and that was in uh, Brooklyn, New York, right on the coast. And from there, I went to uh, a, a, a fireman school, and that was in Baltimore, Maryland. And then um, went down to um, uh, Miami to have some further training in um, machinery and engines. Um, I didn't want to be underneath the deck <laughs> on a ship. Um, so there was nothing else that was open at the time except a, a chief walked into our classroom and said uh, we need volunteer divers and I put my hand up I didn't know what he, what he was talking about but <laughs> anything to get away from the engine room I guess um, they sent me to uh, Washington DC to the US Navy diving school this is a deep sea a diving school with the hard hat equipment and such. Um, I was there for a couple of months and they uh, sent me to Piney Point, Maryland. In, in Piney Point, Maryland was the um, uh, torpedo testing range. From what I understood, um, almost all the torpedoes that were used aboard the fleet during the war were tested first with dummy warheads shot off of barges and at the end of their run they would sink and of course us divers uh, had to uh, go down and uh, retrieve them um, it was uh, the ship was called the my goodness okay don't worry. <laughs> uh, you told me about the Nantucket lightship uh, Tell us, it worked. Okay, this was, I was diving uh, during the war, then after the war, after um, uh, J the Japanese surrendered, um, they had, I didn't have enough points, as they call it, to get out of the service at the time, so they, they sent me to the Nantucket Lightship, which is off of uh, Nantucket Island, anchored about 80 miles offshore and actually it's a floating lighthouse. Uh, had large beacons on it to warn the ships that, that came in from uh, Europe to, uh, to warn them about the rocky shoals and uh, to direct them into either Boston or New York. And um, I was on there just a, just a few months uh, something that I ha that I'll never forget. Some of the uh, hospital ships approached us, and I can't tell you how many wounded um, sailors, soldiers were on these ships, uh, and they would wave to us and summon bandages and such, and we'd wave back because we were the first. Americans, I guess, that they've seen uh, since uh, Europe, and we all had tears in our eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, by the way, he has old Life magazine pictures of the Nantucket Lightship, right. uh, which uh, we can uh, okay. include in this uh, kind of thing. Uh, what did you do after you, co you were a Coast Guardsman? <laughs> when I returned to civilian life, Okay, after I was discharged, uh, they, well, they sent us to um, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and that's where I was discharged. They gave me a ticket back to Chicago, where I lived. <coughs> and a um, short time after I was discharged, <coughs> I uh, went to an aviation school under the GI Bill. And... Um, I got uh, an E, an engine license to work on aircraft, and I worked at um, a Skymotive Airport, which today is known as O'Hare Field. Mm, okay.
While I was in the Air Force, I did a number of things. Uh, mostly, my primary career field is I was accounting and finance. Then for four years, I was a student training advisor on Lowry. And then when I was in the Air National Guard, I worked supply. I drove a truck and a forklift. And then in the Air Force Reserves, I went back to finance. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you choose the Air Force? That's a real good question. I, I think for a number of reasons. One, I had an uncle in the Air Force at the time, and I was real impressed with their whole demeanor, their attitude with their, their personnel. Air Force goes more for the mental than the physical. Uh, we support the, the planes, the mission, and everything that everyone else does is around that mission. Mm -hmm. And I was just very impressed with the, the whole aspect of the Air Force. How long were you in the service? I was in the service in the Air Force for a total of 22 years. Uh, nine years I was on active duty, six years with the Air National Guard, Colorado Air National Guard, and the rest of the time I was with the Air Force Reserves. I became a POW in career on the uh, 24th of April, 1951. My unit was in a defensive position on what we call the Kansas Line, uh, right near the Injun River, which was north of Weijumbu. Uh, we got hit by an overwhelming force of Chinese that evening, uh, approximately two divisions, I understand. We fought them pretty heavily most of the night. Uh, but eventually we were overpowered and overrun. Uh, I had got shot in the legs and I fell down. And as I was going down, I got hit by a grenade. When I woke up the following morning, I was a prisoner of war. There was a Chinese trooper standing over me with a uh, bayonet prodding me to get up. I couldn't walk, so they dragged me down to the hill to an area where they, they had the uh, other POWs that they had collected. We stayed there for about a day, and I was there with a couple of good friends of mine, uh, uh, Hershey Miyamura and Gene Ramos, who were also at my unit. And uh, Hershey helped to carry me for about 10 miles, but the Chinese thought I was slowing down the column, so they ordered Hershey in uh, to throw me at the side of the road. I stayed in a ditch. For about two days, I couldn't move, I couldn't walk, and was losing a lot of blood. Uh, another Chinese unit that was going to the rear uh, saw me. They picked me up, and they put me on kind of a push cart. And they took me north, uh, it's about 35 miles, where I met a couple of other POWs. Uh, one was a Turk uh, from the Turkish Brigade they had there. One was from my company. Uh, one was an Air Force pilot uh, who was in a uh, belonged to Mosquito Squadron and had got shot down. He got hit in the belly of the aircraft and it burned and he had to parachute out. He was the only one that could walk. Uh, the other two friends of mine, uh, Dave McNabb and uh, Billy Christopoulos, uh, they were wounded uh, probably a little worse than I was. We were in pretty bad shape. The Chinese didn't feed us. They didn't do anything for us. The pilot that they shot down, uh, Lieutenant Shattuck, was allowed to roam freely within the area. Uh, he picked up grass and uh, roots, anything that was edible. Uh, in fact, he swapped his flight jacket for a sack of gruel from a passing Korean farmer. And uh, I don't know if you're eating gruel or not there, but it kind of tastes like chewing on sand. But uh, it, uh, it's the only thing we had to eat for almost two months. Uh, one of the fellows, I, I, I don't think I'd like to mention his name because if his parents uh, happen to see this particular show, uh, he, he died. He was in a lot of agony. Uh, he had a gunshot wound in his leg. Uh, it became severely infected. We asked the Chinese if they would uh, operate on him and take care of him, and they refused. Lieutenant Shattuck and I asked the Chinese if they would uh, give us a sharp instrument of some kind that uh, 
we would amputate his leg. Uh, even though we didn't have any expertise in there, we, we knew that he was going to die uh, sooner or later. They refused again. After many, many days of suffering, uh, he finally succumbed. And Lieutenant Shattuck and I, uh, I couldn't walk, but I could hobble at that time. We dragged him out of the, the hut that we were in, and we put him in a, a little cellar enclosure where the Koreans keep their uh, kimchi pots. The other two fellows who were with me uh, were, were probably in the same uh, medical situation as he was, and uh, we doubt if they had maybe two, three more weeks to live. So we had plotted to escape. Uh, Lieutenant Shattuck and I, uh, in the evening, we would crawl up on the hill above the house that we were in, and we got straw and we uh, set up a POW sign. And uh, we came back and we drew straws about who was going to escape him or I, and, and uh, he decided uh, he had a better chance of escaping than I did. Uh, and he had left me behind because I could hobble around a little to, to take care of the, the other POWs. One evening he just left the hut and uh, walked on down to the Indian River like he was uh, getting us uh, some water and he kept going. Uh, he swam down the Indian River for about two and a half, three days in the frigid water and ice. A very heroic trek for him. Uh, he almost got caught a couple of times when he encountered a couple of North Koreans. He finally made contact with the 1st Cavalry Division, explained the story, and being a pilot, he, he knew how to direct them to our position. Uh, he told them that uh, we had erected a POW sign, and he told them that he left me behind with the group to kind of look out for them. The next day when he was gone, the Chinese came in and they wanted to, to know where, where the officer was, and, and uh, we just indicated that some other Chinese unit took him up north, I guess, for interrogation. So they just kind of left, shook their heads. Anyway, three days later, uh, very early in the morning, about dawn, uh, we had a flight of Corsairs, Navy Corsairs, uh, piloted by Marines. They came in and strafed uh, the whole area that we were in there, all the way around the hills, where the Chinese were maintaining the security. And there was about two sorties, if I remember correctly. And then the... Uh, there was about five or six tanks, I'm not sure of the number, uh, uh, from the 5th Cavalry uh, Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division came in. They blazed uh, the area and uh, they surrounded the, the hut that we were in. And they, they took us out on stretches and put us on the leeward side because we were still getting a lot of fire from the hills. But anyway, they came about 45 miles deep into the enemy territory. And they got us and they brought us back to the 1st Cavalry headquarters and we were rushed to the nearest hospital we can. Uh, okay. You mentioned Hirsch. Uh, his name is actually him. Hiroshi. But tell, tell us about him. Uh, and that you're going to see him next week. Okay. Uh, you want me to call him Hirsch or Hiroshi? What, what uh, I'll, I'll mention both. Yeah. Uh, my good friend, Sergeant uh, uh, Hiroshi Miyamura, uh, we also call him Hershey for short. Uh, that evening we were on the hill. Uh, he earned the Medal of Honor. Uh, he had killed about 50 Chinese and he defended his positions until he was overrun. He was wounded also. And as I mentioned previously, I, I met him down in the collection area and, and uh, being old friends, uh, he, he carried me for about 10 miles even though he was slightly wounded until the Chinese made me go. But, uh, he was a prisoner for almost three years, and he told me that it's a good thing that I didn't go with him because I would have never made the trek. Uh, they, were, they were shooting the prisoners that couldn't keep up with after that point. But uh, he and Gene Ramos there uh, suffered quite a bit in that, uh, particularly in the area of, uh, of food. They had very, very little food, and they, they went through the, uh, the motions of attending. <laughs> these uh, brainwash uh, uh, type sessions that the North Koreans had, but they said it was so laughable that nobody could believe what they were saying. In any event, uh, at the end of the war, uh, when uh, Hershey or Hershey Miyamura came back over Freedom Bridge, uh, the commanding general of the 3rd Division at the time met him at Freedom Bridge uh, to tell him that 
he had been awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroic service on that hill on the 24th of April, 51, and he was flabbergasted. Uh, Hershey's just a down-to-earth guy, a very nice guy, and just kind of overwhelmed him there, but he, he deserved it. Uh, in fact, if I was giving it to him, he'd probably get two of them. Okay. Uh, yeah. I also forgot to mention there that uh, next week we're going to meet him down in Alamosa. Uh, the state of Colorado is having a, uh, a ceremony in honor of the 50th anniversary of the end of the Korean War. And Hershey Miyamura, along with a couple of other POWs, are uh, going to be there. And, and uh, I'm honored to be there with them. They're going to be in a parade and a ceremony. Right after high school, I enlisted at age 17 in the Army Air Corps, uh, in the cadet program. And I went in in June of 43 and uh, went through all of the uh, training, uh, and which involved uh, uh, a term at college, because all of us were so young. And then we uh, also uh, went through some basic training, uh, and then we went to cadet classification, where you took exams and you uh, had the opportunity to qualify for pilot, navigator, or bombardier. Now, at the time, uh, Everybody wanted to be a pilot, and so the program was backed up, and they were sending the uh, uh, students down to wash windshields and stuff like that. And my best buddy and I, who'd met uh, at the railroad station when we, uh, our parents took us down to send us off, we decided, hey, uh, gee, there's a shortage of navigators. Now, it never occurred to us why there'd be a shortage of anything during, world, during war, so we said, let's be navigators. <laughs> and uh, so we went through that program, which involved aerial gunnery training and uh, uh, pre-flight and uh, then flying school, in which we got 250 hours uh, of navigational training in the air. And, and then uh, we were commissioned, most of us were commissioned as second lieutenants, others as flight officers. And uh, crew assembly went on in 44, uh, and uh, I was out in Rapid City, South Dakota, and uh, we assembled our crew. And then we shipped over uh, in the fall of 44 to England uh, in the 8th Air Force. And there my buddy and I were separated. He went to one group and I went to another, which was Polbrook for the 351st Bomb Group. Now we still have 1,200 paid members in our Bomb Group Association. Average age is probably early 80s now. I'm one of the younger ones. And uh, uh, we meet yearly. Uh, I'm a member of the, uh, in fact, I'm the commander of the Parker VFW Post 4266. We have 31 members, but we only have about five or six active people. It's a problem getting young people particularly to take the time even to go to one meeting a month. But we have fun. We put the flags up in downtown Parker. Uh, and uh, I flew uh, my missions mostly in, in early 45. Uh, I flew 30 combat missions, all with the same crew. Uh, we had one uh, minor wound. My ball turret uh, gunner got hit by what they now call friendly fire. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, we completed our missions. And uh, then we flew back. Uh, an aircraft uh, the, uh, to, to the States, uh, and I got back in June of 45. I was assigned to the Air Transport Command and California, and I was out there for about three or four months, and I had enough points to get out uh, of active duty, and so I did. I stayed in the inactive reserve for 10 years, and. Uh, then I resigned my commission because uh, I'd come to the conclusion airplanes were dangerous and I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'd gone to engineering school in the GI Bill. So that briefly is a history up to almost the present time. Well, I can add one thing which uh, I think was uh, rather interesting. At our uh, 
we have these yearly reunions, and we get about three or four hundred of us show up, including wives, girlfriends, and uh, some kids. Uh, and we have them in a different place around the country every year. In 2000, our British friends, uh, FOAT, Friends of the Eighth, uh, invited us to have our reunion in the UK, and we did, and it was absolutely incredible. Uh, our air base, Polebrook, is close to uh, a town called Peterborough, which is quite well known historically, and uh, we have a memorial at uh, uh, about a uh, half an acre or an acre of ground which we lease uh, from, uh, you can't own the stuff, but we lease it from the owner who is a Mrs. Lane and uh, we have a chunk of the east end, east end of the main runway. We built a memorial there about 20 years ago uh, and they flew a B-17 over for us uh, as a surprise Typically good British summer flying weather, drizzle, rain, very familiar. Uh, one of the nicest things was at the banquet that was held, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, sent us a letter. And he said in part, if it weren't for people like you, this letter would be in German. And that was very impressive. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, the British people are so aware, particularly the kids, uh, they're very much aware of what went on, and they should be because they were close to it. Their parents were, were close to it. And uh, the, uh, there was a, at the banquet, they mixed us in with a bunch of children from the small town of Aundel. These were school kids. Uh, and we, uh, there was a young 14-year-old girl who asked me, uh, how old was I when I was flying combat? And I said, I was 19. And she looked at me, she said, I have a hard time picturing you as 19. So when I got home, I had a studio photo taken uh, when I graduated from flying school. So I had a nice copy made and I sent it to her. And she sent me a letter written on lavender paper with gold ink. I could hardly read the damn thing. And she mounted the thing in a frame and, of course, all her young schoolmates knew who I was. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, I would not expect that of similar age people, kids here, we're too far away. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, mention the fact most people are unaware of how young we all were. My CO at the time was a full bird colonel. He was 25 years old. Uh, the general in charge of the wing, General Lacey, was 31. Uh, the oldest man in my crew was 21. I was about the average age for the combat air crew, 19. My gunners are 18. Uh, and we were all very young. Uh, and a lot of remarkable flying was done considering we were all low-time flyers.